I took the description of this session literally, from body armor to negotiations. Um, for some of you who have perhaps worked for municipalities where there has been a tad bit of, well, unfriendliness with your neighbors, you might understand why, in fact, we might be talking about disarming the intermunicipal uh, wars that go on out there. And so, actually, I'm, I'm attired, and, and you'll notice that there is a bit of a military bent to some of what I'm presenting. Um, I, I'm hoping that, in fact, uh, we've learned in Alberta from some other famous people who have gone into battles wrongly, and we're going to do it right. I'm happy to be wearing the, uh, the tartan of the 7th U.S. Cavalry right now. Um, if you don't know the 7th U.S. Cavalry, that was George Custer's um, famous uh, <clears throat> group. And uh, George didn't get a chance to learn from his lessons. I'm hoping that in the province of Alberta that we, uh, we in fact do. So another great uh, leader that, whose advice I like to take was someone who learned uh, the hard way during World War II. And I think, again, in the province of Alberta, um, given some of the concerns that were raised about the, the pre-1995 regional planning, um, that in fact we have gained the experience we need to move forward in a positive way, um, not one that, that is negative. So what are the challenges with intermunicipal planning? How many of you have never gotten into that particular part of the MGA in practice? Hands up. Anissa, come on. Hi. Who? Ah, good. Rookies. I like that. So um, part, of, part of what happens when you have people who haven't been through this process is even if the province lays out something that's a little more articulate than what they have right now, there's going to be confusion going forward as to who's doing what, how do we make this happen, who sets up the timelines, what happens in, oh, by the way, two years to make this all happen, um, what database do we work on? And so if you wind up in a situation where there isn't a clear path for it, if you don't start, as I like to talk to my graduate students about, with an end in mind, it's a really good chance you won't get to the end, or at least not the end you've intended. So part of what we need to do is, is to try and find some clarification. The other major difference, Gary alluded to it, uh, when I was town manager of High River, I heard it all the time, uh, Okotoks beat High River, and I forget what hockey game it was back in, I don't know when, but, but High River was really interested in getting back at Okotoks for that. And darn, Okotoks got all that development, and it just wasn't fair. And they got a, a Tim Hortons before High River did, and, and there was just a whole bunch of competition. In fact, as I was told that my job was on the line until we got the very first Tim Hortons. I, I never knew that that was part of, of you know, CAO um, evaluation. But, but in that competition, for different kinds of development, the provinces learned that we've created an environment for ourselves that is just not functional. Two municipalities close to each other trying to get the same development through the door is a bad situation. Bad from the standpoint that taxpayers on both sides can lose in the process because the land development community takes a look at, particularly with commercial and industrial development, looks at two municipalities that are not friendly competitors but are arch rivals and they decide they want to go someplace else where the environment is a little more conducive to a positive, innovative approach. There's contention. She said, he said, I like him, don't like her. Often happens at the council level, not at the staff level, but contention is part of what we have to deal with. There's confrontation. You know, and, and we've all seen or heard of counselors or mayors um, who have, in fact, confronted their neighbor and uh, talked about uh, how we were better and they shouldn't have, shouldn't have done what they did. I've got a story later on that we'll talk that. And then there's council to council combat, where in fact it, the, words, the words go past being civil and go into an uncivil dialogue. None of those things take us where we want to go. So what are, the le what, are what I talk about, the three legs of intermunicipal sustainability? And from a legislative point of view, we have three legs to deal with. The starting place for intermunicipal sustainability was, in fact, the Land Stewardship Act. And we may not recognize that. It's been in the back in the history, but it started us in this move. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Bill 20, which was adopted a year ago, took us the next step. And the modernized MGA is going to take us the rest of the way, good, bad, or ugly. So what did ALSA leave us with? 
Well, it started us with the regional planning responsibility and the fact that we were going to, as municipalities, be responsible for, in fact, implementing regional plans. Not much specifics on that, but I defy a regional plan from being implemented without some degree, a high degree, of intermunicipal cooperation and collaboration. You just can't do regional planning unless you have some degree of communication and cooperation. And it also provided us with a tool that I think, as you'll see shortly, gives us a way for two municipalities to start to talk to each other constructively. So Bill 20 comes in, heralds the new era, the next phase of the new era, and we're going to get annexation guidance. What's that mean? Well, to me as a former municipal planner as well as a municipal CAO, it means that the province isn't happy with the annexation process that has been in front of us. They're not happy with the fact that urban municipalities and the view of rural municipalities have played Pac-Man with the rural urban or with the rural fringe. They're not happy with the fact that oftentimes those annexations are not uncontested. They're not happy with the fact that they're spending money with the MGB hearings, that you've gotten disputes with landowners going on. They're not happy with the fact that there's not a clear understanding of where municipalities are going. It's a, well, tomorrow's a new day, let's see how much land we can eat kind of process. The other thing that I think is key out of the uh, Bill 20, having written a few IDPs, is now we have a clear hierarchy. IDPs in the past have not been viewed, in my estimation, as the premier document. I can read it that way as a planner, reading, understanding that, gee, we've got to be intermunicipal before we do municipal. But now with Bill 20, there's no doubt. And so what that means is what you set as a framework in your intermunicipal development plan is now going to have to be repeated through your MDPs and then down through your ASPs and your ARPs. So while the IDP wouldn't necessarily cover the entirety of your municipality, it will have an impact on how you plan your municipality, particularly at those urban and rural fringe areas. And the consistency point is they're now saying, previously you said it should be consistent. Well, the verb's changed. You must comply now. It must be consistent now. And I'm thinking, I don't know about you guys, but I really don't like judges being the ones who tell me, or the MGB who tells me whether or not my plan is consistent with what I've written in another place. I'd really ha rather have my staff and my community and my council and my neighbor's community and council work together to come up with something that's consistent rather than letting the legal people do it. I, I like lawyers, I just don't like the messing in land use. So the modernized MGP, B, MGA, excuse me, what does that mean? So for urbans, okay, the two major urban areas, you're getting growth management boards. Um, talk to some people from Calgary about that and they're not happy about getting a growth management board. I can understand why they're not happy. Uh, I can understand why the provincial government wants them to have one, is because despite a great collaborative effort to do a regional plan, um, it is still referred to in many places as the Swiss cheese plan, because the rural municipalities that have the land aren't part of the planning process, and it's only the urbans, the holes in the cheese, that are within the plan boundaries at this point in time. So somewhere along the line, we've got to get urbans and rurals playing together. That said, that plan is the starting place that I think has some merit to take a look at how they did it and what they've done along the way. Because in that plan, they dealt with land use from a growth management perspective at a very high level. And I think growth management and regional planning almost is inherently at a high level. We're probably not getting down to picking out not just which quarter sections are going to grow, but which part of which quarter section? Is the back 40 going to develop? Are we going to do 20 acre parcels? Are we going to do a subdivision? It needs to be at that higher level. What the Calgary Regional Partnership did and the Metropolitan Plan did, there was a servicing discussion. Now, that has gotten the, the partnership in trouble because they've come up and said, well, we're not going to share our water with you and we're not going to share our wastewater treatment capacity with you unless you agree to our growth density and the rural municipality said, no, nah, not so much. We don't like eight to 10 units per acre. I'm not sure how that's going to look in a hamlet. 
in uh, Mountain View or in Rocky View County or in the MDF foothills. But they talked about it. They talked about service delivery. They started to talk about cost sharing for key things like transportation, like economic development, and their dispute resolution system fell down. So now they're going to have to come back and deal with that. The good news would be if that was only coming to the capital region and the Calgary region. But as the next point on the slide shows, it's coming to all of us. Congratulations. You're now in the middle of exactly the same discussion. They're just not calling it a growth management board. They're saying it's mandatory regional planning is coming at you and you require collaboration on service delivery and on cost sharing. And I think they stopped too short. My experience in municipal, in municipal government says to me that it's not a question of cost sharing that is at issue in discussions between municipalities. It's what about the revenue sharing side of the equation? Because it's easy to talk about cost sharing. Municipalities are always happy to share the cost. No problem, you can have this share of my cost. What they're less willing to do is share a share of the revenue or give a share of the revenue that's coming in through the door. And so in this instance, I think we need to go broader. I think, and I'm hoping that the province talks about that, but I'm telling you as the people who are going to have to implement it, my recommendation is that we don't stop at cost sharing. Gary talked about the, the, pot, the potential for this to go sideways to create more disruption rather than more collaboration. I think the place that you're gonna lose traction is if you don't talk about two sides of the, of the economics equation, the costs and the revenues. And my third bullet there drags me back to regional planning and transferable development credits because in regional planning, particularly in the big regional plans that the province is giving you, they're far more about conservation and, re and resource management than they are about growth management for urban boundaries. And so that says to me that at some point in time, we are all going to be drawn into the discussion about how do we allocate resources and what kind of conservation should we have and how do we manage growth so that we protect those key resources? And transferable development credits, coming back at us from ALSA, is in fact a tool that we can look at dealing with that we can talk intermunicipally about. Because growth, as J.C. Penney knew, is not something that happens by chance, it's something that you have to work out together. So intermunicipal collaboration, there's going to be a minimum coming at us for intermunicipal planning, minimum standards and a minimum list of services. And again, I would suggest that should be exactly what it is, a minimum list. If we're going to collaborate, we have to make these intermunicipal agreements fit into your municipality. If they don't fit your municipality, if they only go with the minimums, you're going to wind up in a situation where somewhere down the road, it's not gonna work anymore. What does that mean? That means that what, whatever goodwill you've created can likely be spent pretty fast. And so how do we do it in two years' time? We'll talk about that in a minute. Another opportunity that I see coming at us for intermunicipal, collab intermunicipal collaboration is with respect to the new environmental reserve category of conservation reserve. So as you probably, or you may be aware, the, we're now you're now going to be able to ask as a municipality for a conservation reserve. But you're going to have to compensate the landowner for that conservation area. How many of you are in a municipality that's got spare money that would love to spend it on buying land to conserve natural environment? Please put up your hands if you're in that kind of a municipality. That's what I thought. So how do we compensate, all right? To me, it looks like a whole, an interesting possibility, but how do we get to compensation? Well, there's a number of, of opportunities that we have. Um, some in this room may be involved with the ALICE program, Alternate Land Use Strategies that pays for conservation of wetlands on an, on an annual basis. That's a potential. We have environmental covenants that are a possibility that we can put in place to cover some of this, where in fact, depending on the nature of the sensitivity that you're conserving, there may be a tax incentive to do that to the landowner. But the third way is the transferable development credit tool. Now, we've had that in the province for a while. I know that uh, MD at Bighorn has tried it. It's still sitting at Cabinet, waiting for Cabinet to figure out what it is. But in fact, is it's a tool that's been given to us through ALSA that we have to find a way of making work because 
with, land, with transferable development credits, the development doesn't have to stay in the municipality that the credits come from. Some of the successful programs that I've seen in the U.S. actually worked exactly opposite that, where the conservation lands stay in the county, the conserved lands, and they were through agreements with the urban municipalities. King County is a good example. The urban municipalities are requiring a development credit to do certain kinds of development within the city, within the urban municipality. So the credit, the conservation of lands within the rural context, which benefit all those urban residents, are paid for by development in that urban municipality, not out of the municipality's back pocket. The municipality is certainly free to buy and sell those credits as well, or buy those credits as well, but the fact of the matter is, development it can pay for the conservation we're talking about. And successful programs that, that we've worked at, we've looked at in the, in the states, often have a mix of private and, or public sector and private sector paying for the credits. But the key thing is that we work together with the development industry and with the, with the municipalities. So what does intermunicipal success look like? Well, it's the six C's up there. Communication, key. Gary talked about it. It's absolutely essential. But I would say it's essential in a way that we're probably not used to it today. How many of you send your referrals by email to your neighboring municipalities? Come on, be honest. Okay? How many of you go face to face and talk to your neighbors about your referrals? Hmm, no hands. We're missing today face to face communication. Intermunicipal collaboration, intermunicipal cooperation, intermunicipal planning is going to be based on trust and respect. And the only way you gain trust and respect is to know the person across the table from you. And if you don't know your neighbor, it's very, very easy to assume certain things about them. If they make a decision that you don't understand about, they're obviously ill-informed. If they, if they recommend against something that you think is great, they probably don't have well, a real solid understanding of what the real facts are all about. Sounds an awful lot to me like what happens in the U.S. presidential debates. But the fact of the matter is we have to, we, we need to change course a little bit in what we're doing. And so communication needs to shift. I know it's the digital generation, but there's nothing like a little face-to-face -face conversation. We've got to coordinate more than roads, making sure they match up. We have to cooperate. We have to collaborate. We have to have courage, because a lot of this is going to take some courage on the part of your councils, and courage on your part to recommend going further than what you might all, what would be the easy path out. And you've got to be committed. So communication. Well, we assume that it takes place, but oftentimes, but now we're going to be required, I would say, to make sure it happens. So a case study. Richard Parker's here. Richard and I were opposite sides on this battlefield. This is the boundary of Red Deer and Red Deer County back in 2007, I think, Richard. And I liken it, because I come from the states originally, I liken it to the American Civil War, because I can almost hear the rural drummers beating and the trenches being dug, trying to keep that darn city at bay. And of course, it was counselors that were out there from the county that were helping to dig the trenches to make this, this confrontation happen. But it's classic. If you look at that edge, and, and I'm, I'm really big professionally on an urban rural edge, that, all, that whole edge says to me is expect urban development in the future. It does not talk, look like the kind of edge that's going to transition out into future agriculture. Here's the old IDP. We've got some interesting growth boundaries. This is the gasoline alley area. We all know where Gasoline Alley is along Highway 2, all right? That's in Red Deer County. If you didn't know, that's not in the city of Red Deer, that's Red Deer County. And so this is the old IDP. There was some, some agreement about city expansion to the, uh, to the east. There's some agreement about city expansion uh, to the west, all right? Gasoline Alley's down here. This was an area that was under future review. But it was time. The IDP had written, I think it was probably about 10 years old in 2008, maybe a touch older than that. And then the city came out with this. Red Deer at 300,000. And Gasoline Alley is now in the city. So what was going on in parallel is that the county, uh, where I was director of planning, we were looking at how to turn Gasoline Alley into more than a place to empty a tank and fill up a tank. 
Uh, what we're looking at it as an opportunity to create within the county our first truly complete community where there would be employment opportunities, there would be commercial opportunities, and there would be a residential community. And we actually had some pretty funky kinds of designs going on. If you've been to uh, Michael Van Housen's uh, previous presentation, or you see him tomorrow, Mike was the, was the uh, urban designer that was working with us on this. We're looking at Gasoline Alley as being an important part of the county going forward. And it was a nose-to-nose -nose confrontation. This is just a portion of the clippings that were in the paper for pretty much two years. I personally attended a number of intermunicipal affairs committee meetings that I likened to what it must have been like in, in Parliament where you were more than two sword lengths from each other because that's how they were set up, opposite each other, a great distance between so that nobody could reach over and grab the guys on the other side of the table. It went nowhere. And as it all unfolded, the best comment isn't in here, and that was from the Reeve of Red Deer County at the time, who called the mayor of, um, or likened the mayor of, of Red Deer, city of Red Deer, to a horse thief. And the, uh, the newspaper reporter at the time uh, asked the Reeve, well, why would you call him a horse thief? And he said, well, he's back in the Old West, back in Western Canada in the day, if you were a thief, all right, and, and you got caught, they just run you out of town because you just stole property. Might throw you in jail for a little while, but other than that, don't do it again. But a horse thief not only stole your property, but he sold your means of making a living. And we hung horse thieves. So you can imagine the, the uh, well, just the, con the way that comment was received in the, uh, in the public setting. And so it was at this point in time, we were headed for the MGB. Richard and I weren't going to be friends. We were going to be opposite uh, sides of a, a major dispute. And literally at the 11th hour, the senior administration for the city of Red Deer came in and said to the assembled group of senior administration and council at, or I guess senior administration initially at Red Deer County, isn't there something we could do to stop this? And everybody went quiet except for me. I'm known, as first known for shooting my mouth off. And I said, we can write a new IDP. And senior administration for the city said, well, we can't write a new IDP. That's going to take five years. And I said, no, it's not. It's going to take six months. And they said, six months? You can't do it in six months. I said, we can do it in six months. But you have to give us the ability to do it in six months. So what does that mean? So here are some of the points that I think are essential to doing it in a short period of time. And something to think about if you're looking at a two-year deadline to do this. The face-to-face -face communication is absolutely essential. And it's essential for not just staff to staff, but senior staff and council together, senior staff and council with the gloves off, being able to talk to each other so that there's a mutual respect at the table, which means you have to get to know each other. You don't know each other, it's very, very hard to get to that mutual respect. You have to clear the air. I had to clear the air with my colleagues at the city because there had been, it had gotten so bad that there were actually things starting to be said about the professional staff on, the other, on the, each side of the dispute. It was never about the professional staff on each side of the dispute. It was about two councils who couldn't figure out how to talk to each other and make things work. But we have to clear the air. And we did clear the air on that. Sometime off camera, I'll tell you about that story. But the fact is you have to get to that understanding. If there's a burr under one side saddle, you got to get that burr out. And it's got to be talked about openly. Staff and council at the table, and you build trust. And so what they trusted us to do is they put us together in a facilitated session, planner to planner, that's where I cleared the air. We came out of two days, planner to planner, with a schedule and a process for the IDP that showed us that we could do it in six months time. We brought it back to the uh, joint meeting of two councils and we did this in less than a week. This wasn't two meetings over the next five months, this was professionals meeting two days in a row, followed by a meeting with senior administration and the council of both municipalities, and before the end of the week, we had a mandate to move forward with the IDP, period. It was serious enough that we wanted to do it and spend the time to make it happen. 
And I'm going to tell you that time can either be your friend or your enemy in these processes because what we got as, as planners who are leading this process is we got the consent of two political bodies. You didn't get consensus. We got consent. And consent mean, meant, and still means to me, that both sides have given up something to get something they really value and they're going to defend that agreement. And we got consent and we now had to live with that. So what did we get at the end of the day from this? We actually did an IDP in four months and six days from startup to adoption, including the public engagement process. Now this was not as detailed as some of the, as some of the IDPs are likely to be or intermissible collaboration plans are going likely to be. But depending on how, loud, how deep the, and you're getting into the details, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take a lot of extra time as long as you work at the process diligently. So what we got was a 10-year commitment on the IDP with an annual review. Not an annual rewrite, an annual review. What's happening? What should we look at? What kinds of things have come up that we didn't think about in the, in the past year that we now need to look at including in the IDP so that we can amend it? Where are the growth areas for the city and the county? And we got agreement on that. In our business and land use planning, what's the thing that we all want or the applicants all want? Is certainty. Absolute certainty. We got an agreement on the certainty for both the city and the county about future development. And that's priceless. Joint review of applications within the city's future growth area. So we were at the table face to face once a month reviewing applications in the city's growth area. Why? Because we knew at the county that in fact it was going to be the future requirements and the regulations of the city that were going to control the day in that area. And so they needed to be at the table despite the fact that it was in an area that was controlled by the county under, the, under our boundaries. Joint ASPs, projects and studies were agreed to. A dispute resolution process that had a maximum 75 days start to finish. In, out and done. You don't agree, you don't need to 690 each other, this is the rules, this is the way it happens, you lay out the process, and before it ever got to councils, the two CEOs would get together and try and make it work. So we tried to resolve things at the administration level as much as we could before we took it back to council and let the council get into a fight. And we gave a very long-term annexation agreement, 100 years worth of land. So this was what was agreed to at the end of the day in the new IDP. What the county agreed to was 205 quarter sections of land being available for future annexation without dispute. 205 quarter sections. More than twice the size of the existing city of Ray. What did the county get? The county got a boundary defined gasoline alley County. Commitments were made that in the taxed area there would be no urbanization. We also got a commitment about the uh, Springbrook, uh, Hamlet for Springbrook, which is around the, uh, next to the airport. Why would we do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the tax base off of 205 quarter sections that were being farmed is not worth an awful lot of money. If you're working for your own municipality, it's based on what the crops are grown off of that. There's some industrial land in this area. We're, we're getting compensated for those. The county's getting compensated. But the fact of the matter is, really what we needed from a county point of view was the certainty for our own growth. We needed to know what our future looked like and where we were going to spend our time and effort. And so I made the case to county council a couple of ways. First of all, I said to the county council, I said, look, let's be serious. We agreed to any kind of major IDP expansion. Where are the developers going to go in advance of annexation to get development in place at a lower standard than what they would get if they were in the city of Redding? They're going to go to the county office. So I said, let's be serious. If we, if we offer a big area for annexation to the, to the city, the developers are not going to be going to the city hall and say, hey, when you're, when you're ready to annex, let me know because I want to develop. They're going to come to my office. They're going to be using county staff time to try and, for us to try and protect the interests of the city in these areas. So I don't want to do it. 
I said, because quite honestly, for the next 100 years, 90% of your, your rate payers' taxes that they pay for planning are going to go into here and not to the rest of the county. I said, I talked to all the counselors, I said, so how many of you want to go back to your constituents and say, oh, you're only going to get 10 cents on the dollar for the taxes that you're paying for planning in the greater county? And the rest of us going to go around ready. I said, well, no, we don't want to do that. I said, thank you very much. What we really want to do is we really want the city's standards and the city's comments to hold sway in this whole area. That is, if we can find a way of literally delegating approvals in here, we will do that. If we need to amend bylaws in here, the city's going to recommend what we do with the bylaws. If we need to do a new ASP, it's going to be the city that tells us what that ASP looks like. Because quite honestly, from a county perspective, I've got a lot more fish to fry across the rest of the county than what's happening in here. The other side of it was a cost-benefit analysis. We costed out the, the proposed future development of gas and alley and the tax revenue from a developed gas and alley based on the master plan that Michael and Housing Office get to equal the taxes generated by the entire rest of the county. What certainty worth? How about doubling your tax base in about 14 quarter sections or 20 quarter sections? That's worth an awful lot to me. And that doesn't even add in what happens with spring bank. What happens at the airport when you start to get some industrial development happening in Spring Bay? Quite honestly, this is just border wars. This is just fighting for territory. At the end of the day, we're a municipal government, and we have to provide services. Let me provide services in here and here that the tax base supports, and trying to provide services out in here that I have no idea how I'm going to support. So there's Radio 3000, 300,000. There's the IDP. There's right here 300,000. With the exception of Gasoline Alley, that looks an awful lot like right here 300,000. So our results, communication, results, coordination, servicing initiatives. Got to talk about servicing initiatives and the kind of things that can happen if you don't do it right. So while we're planning this growth of Gasoline Alley, we're under contract with the city for the delivery of, we purchased bulk water and we distribute it to Gasoline Alley. And we saw a new development coming to Gasoline Alley, and this is in the middle of this disagreement. And so we went back to the city and said, hey, can you sell us you know, a few thousand extra liters of water per day for this new development? And the city said, no. Oh. So that was fine, because in Springbrook, we had our own well that provided, could provide a lot of water, and it was two and a half kilometers of new pipeline we put in, and so we said, fine. We'll put in our, we'll use our own well, we'll put in our own water line, we'll take it in, we'll connect it to the reservoir that we have in Gasoline Alley. And the city took us to court. And here's one of the reasons why you do not want a judge deciding land use matters for you, because the judge ruled that the county could not commingle atoms of water from, from a county well with atoms of water from the city service in the same reservoir. And I had a vision, I'm an engineer by training, I had a vision of a nuclear explosion happening that the top of the reservoir would blow right off and we, we would have discovered cold fusion accidentally by blending county water and city water. But we had, we had a judge tell us that you couldn't put water from two sources, both treated, both essentially Red Deer River water treated to the same standard in the same reservoir because it would somehow violate some natural right. So the county had to build an extra two and a half million dollar reservoir in order to support its own. Oh, by the way, we tied the pipes together eventually outside the reservoir, but the fact of the matter is the water's never commingled so we didn't have a threat of nuclear devastation in Gasoline Alley. But, it's, but we're, we, the, the, it's the kind of thing that can happen when we don't think our way through situations, when we, when we let emotion and deal with it rather than having trust and collaboration. So we had, we had shared authority on city growth areas, we collaborated on land use and growth management, and we, were, we, used, we had fiscally responsible use of planning staff. And so at the end of the day, and you can, I don't know who's wearing the white hat and the black hat in that, my friend at the city always claimed that he was in the white hat and that was me in the black hat. But the fact of the matter is, if you're a cowboy and you're in the Western country, you learn how to, how to work together to get the herd in and nobody really cares at the end of the day. 
And sometimes, as John Wayne said, you just got to saddle up and do it no matter what. Credit to my friend Agus Schaffenberg, who recently retired from the city of Red Deer for uh, his cooperation in some of the slides on this. 